All right, so we will now uh, uh, decouple this long range Coulomb interaction by Hubbard Stratonovich. There are various types of Hubbard Stratonovich transformations for fermions, bosons, uh, real periodic fields, and so uh, the density is real and beta periodic, so we will uh, use the corresponding uh, transformation. following. So this is some kind of general interaction um, written with some matrix A that can be decoupled as follows, one over square root of a determinant and then the integral over all the hubbard stratonovich fields, so capital N is the number of sites in the lattice and we have as many hubbard stratonovich fields as lattice sites Now we have a term which is quadratic in these fields. And we have a coupling between the density and the Hubbard Stratonovich field. In this notation, somehow the summation is implied by a kind of matrix vector notation. And these fields, phi, they are also real and beta periodic. This A is, of course, just uh, in, uh, the non-local interaction V tilde. So if we apply this, 
transformation to our lattice action, we obtain the following transformed action. That's the sort of hopping part plus now from the hubbard stratonovic uh, transformation, a quadratic part in the hubbard stratonovic field, phi i tau, V tilde, minus one i j by j of tau plus then a local coupling between the Robert Radonovich field and the electrons. And here in these curly brackets we recognize the non-interacting or the inverse of the non-interacting Green's function of the lattice. So this we can in principle write as G zero minus one component IJ, where G zero is the non-interacting lattice Green's function. we use this notation, then we see sort of an analogy now between the fermionic part, which has this quadratic term with the non-interacting lattice Green's function, and the bosonic part, which has a quadratic term with this inverse uh, uh, Coulomb interaction. And so this then motivates us to, to map this system in the extended DMFT approximation to an impurity problem where we have a fermionic Weiss field which describes this hopping of uh, electrons into the bath and back and in analogy to this fermionic Weiss field also a bosonic Weiss field which sort of describes the retarded interaction between these uh, hubbard stratonovich fields. So then if we just, uh, let's just write down the form of this action. So we map it now to the following impurity action in this EDMFT formalism, namely a quadratic term with the fermionic Weiss field and the retarded sort of hopping of the electrons. That's the usual term which we have in DMFT. 
this is this the inverse of this non-interacting impurity Prince function. And then in anal analogy to this, we have a similar retarded term for the hubbard stratonovich fields. some non-local interaction, which I call curly U inverse, which now couples these fields at different times, tau and tau prime. And that is now sort of now the bosonic Weiss field, and this is the fermionic Weiss field. And then we still have the local interaction between this bosonic field and the electron, like this. So this thing here would then be our fermionic Weiss field. This curly U would be our bosonic vice field. And these need to be fixed by a self-consistency condition in such a way that this impurity action somehow reproduces the properties of this lattice model, at least the local properties. Fermionic Weiss field is just a kind of Green's function. So this has sort of the properties of a Green's function. Imaginary time, it's beta antiperiodic, for example. It looks like this. This is G of tau, where this is beta, zero. Whereas this curly U of tau is, uh, more or less of the form of the dynamical interaction which we have discussed before. It's sort of a beta periodic function, looks like this. It's this kind of general structure. And both of these functions now have to be um, fixed in a self-consistent uh, way. Now, it's somehow not very convenient to work with these hubbard stratonovich fields, but once we have done this mapping onto this single side problem of this form, we notice that it's a quadratic action in the phi fields. So we can sort of undo our hubbard stratonovich transformation now for the impurity problem and integrate out again the phi fields and go back to a purely electronic uh, action, and that will now be become an action with a retarded interaction between uh, the electrons. So 
only the following. We can, after sort of undoing our Hubbs-Ratonovich transformation, we find the following action for the impurity system. usual fermionic part, which is unchanged, and now, <coughs> well, this quadratic phi term after the hubbard stratonovich transformation is replaced by a quadratic term in the density, and with the u instead of the u inverse, and this part here disappears, so we have one half integral zero beta d tau d tau prime, and now n of tau curly u tau minus tau prime, n of tau prime, and also from these uh, determinants which appear in the Hubbard-Stratonovich formula, we get another term, which is minus logarithm of square root of determinant of u. Now you see that we have end up with an action which is exactly of the form which we have sort of studied in the last lecture. So some um, impurity system with a general retarded interaction, but now this interaction has to be computed in a self-consistent way by a self-consistency condition, which I still need to explain. And for this term with the logarithm of the square root of the determinant, we can uh, rewrite a little bit as, for example, one half logarithm of the determinant of u, and then we use a formula which says that the determinant of u can be written as the exponential of the trace of logarithm of u. So this is exponential of trace log u, and then the exponential cancels with this uh, logarithm, and then we find this is one half trace log u. Okay. Good. So now we, <coughs> so this is the the action which we really want to use then in the in the calculations. And this is the action with the hubbard stratonovich field, which was sort of um, useful to derive the, the single-site action. Now we need to derive two self-consistency equations, one for the sort of fermionic wise field and one for the bosonic wise field. And basically this will be again based on the identification of the local lattice greens function and the impurity greens function. And both the fermionic and the bosonic uh, greens functions. So now we have to compute the fermionic and the bosonic Green's function of the impurity or problem. So how are they defined? The fermionic Green's function is just as usual, 
the expectation value, or maybe with minus sign of C, C dagger, that you should be familiar with. That's the impurity Green's function where this expectation value means uh, now the expectation value evaluated in this with this impurity action. And the bosonic Green's function we call W is the corresponding correlation function for the phi fields. So that is the expectation value phi tau phi of zero. So now we want to work with this action in which we have integrated out the phi field. So it's a little bit non-trivial how we can get this phi phi correlator from this action. So we need to do a little uh, manipulation to, to see how we can get this from such a purely electronic action. And so we first, first we start with this action here, which I call star. So so from this uh, action with the Hubbard Stratonovich field, we can easily see that this correlation function is simply the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to u minus one. So if we take the derivative with respect to this bosonic Weiss field here, we get the phi phi uh, correlation function, right? Bosonic Green's function can be written as two times d l and z d u minus one. So that follows immediately from this uh, expression here. And now we can manipulate this a little bit and see that this is the same as two times d ln c d u times d u uh, d u minus one and d u d u minus one this is the same as minus u squared so this we can write as minus two u d l and c d u times u. And now we go to this action here with the phi field integrated out here. You see we have the action uh, we have the retarded interaction u in, in the action. So we can easily take the derivative of the logarithm of the partition function with respect to u. So now we evaluate this, this term from, from this action here. And we find the L and C u is nothing else than, well, from this term we get the density-density correlation function. If we take the derivative with respect to u, so our one half times n of tau, and with time ordering, so now it's map of n of tau, n of zero, and now we have to be a little careful, so we have another factor of u here, one half log u. And so if we take the derivative of this one, we get another contribution, which is minus one half one over u. Now we plug this into here, 
and we find the following expression that the bosonic impurity Green's function can be expressed <coughs> as u minus u chi local u with chi local the density density correlation function. And this is something which can be very easily measured with the algorithm that I explained in the previous lecture. So we calculate this with, say, Monte Carlo, and we know u, and then we can compute the screened interaction. So that's how we can do it. Maybe a little practical remark. Usually it's better to define the interaction term with respect to the density fluctuation. So we subtract the average density from these densities here. then uh, this chi local becomes sort of the connected charge-charge correlation function. So Okay, now I think we have everything to set up these two self-consistency loops. loop is the fermionic self-consistency loop, which is completely identical to the one for usual dynamical mean field theory. Let me write it as follows. We have calculated our impurity Green's function by the, say, the Monte Carlo technique, which I described. Then we compute next the impurity self energy by using the impurity Dyson equation. 
then we say that the lattice self energy, the fermionic one, should be this impurity self energy. So we approximate sigma of k i omega n by sigma impurity of i omega n. Well, here i omega n are the fermionic Matsubara frequency. And then we use this approximate self energy to compute the lattice uh, Grings function. So we write g k i omega n, which I mean, the exact expression from the Dyson equation would be the non interacting lattice Grings function inverse minus sigma k i omega n, and this whole thing inverse, that's the exact expression, and this we approximate now with uh, the impurity self energy here. Now we have a lattice, Green's function, and next we compute the local lattice screens function by averaging over momentum. And now we use the dynamical mean wheel self-consistency and say this should be the same as the impurity function, so this is the DMFT self-consistency. And if we do this, then we can use again the impurity Dyson equation and the impurity self energy to obtain now a new uh, Weiss field. So G inverse mu, which is now G local inverse plus the old impurity self energy. And then we use our Monte Carlo or whatever impurity solver to solve the impurity problem with this new Weiss field, and that gives us the Green's function. So that's the fermionic loop. in complete analogy to this fermionic loop, we have a second loop for the bosonic Green's function and the bosonic size field. So let's assume we have computed our bosonic imp uh, impurity Green's function. Then we define sort of the self energy, the bosonic self energy, which is nothing else than the impurity polarization function, which I call here pi. That is defined as the bosonic Weiss field minus the inverse of the impurity Green's function. 
next step is that we approximate the lattice, the bosonic lattice self energy by this impurity self energy. So we approximate the P of K and I nu n, so nu n is now a bosonic Matsubara frequency. We approximate by this impurity polarization. And then we compute with this approximate self energy or polarization the screened interaction in the lattice. And so the exact expression would be the following that W of K and Matsubara frequency I nu n would be, well, the bare interaction, the inverse of the bare interaction, one half V tilde minus one minus this momentum dependent polarization function. And this inverse. So this we now approximate by this impurity uh, polarization. So we find one half V minus one minus impurity polarization. That's now our approximation for the lattice Green's function, bosonic one. And now we sum this over k, or average over k, to get the local Green's function, or the local screen interaction. now supposed to be the same thing as our impurity uh, fully screened interaction. That's the bosonic self-consistency condition. If we use this, we can now use the impurity Dyson equation again for the bosonic, I mean the bosonic version of the Dyson equation to extract a new bosonic Weiss field curly U. Namely, as follows, we get the new curly U minus one, which is from the Bosonic Dyson equation is W local minus one plus the impurity chi, like this. And now in principle we can solve our impurity problem to get the new impurity bosonic screens function or screened interaction, but we need this additional step. So the solver basically gives us First, the chi local, this density density correlation function, and from the density density correlation function, we can then, and this curly u, we can get the impurity uh, w. So that's the bosonic loop. And so now you see the complete analogy between these two loops. We just have to sort of replace the Weiss field by u, curly u, the self-energy by the polarization pi, and the Green's function by the sort of screen interaction w, and then there are two completely analogous loops which fix uh, both the hybridization function or this, this, this 
curly G and the retarded interaction U. In a self-consistent way. And of course, to solve this, we have to employ a, a method which can treat arbitrary uh, retarded U interactions. Yes. So if I need to solve uh, one loop and then the other one, and then what's my case? Uh, well, I think you, you do it at the same time. I mean, you compute W and G in the same simulation, and then you go through both loops at the same time. You update both the curly U and the curly G. So it's sort of simultaneously the same. Yeah. You update both. And the, the solution of the impurity problem gives you both, the, the W and the G. So you yeah, it's one loop, yes. Yeah, 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 it's one. Yeah. yeah, in principle, one each step contains both. Yeah. Do it in simultaneously. No, no. No, that's right. So then maybe as a last topic, I can say a few words about combining the so-called GW method with this extended dynamical mean field formalism. Of course, uh, up to now, I mean, <coughs> what is very nice about this formalism is the, that we now self-consistently compute the interaction U. So we sort of create the screening effects in the system in a, in a self-consistent way, and that gives us the, the dynamical U. But we still have a completely local self-energy. So this pi and this sigma is completely local. And in a real system, of course, we have some momentum dependence in these uh, self-energies, sigma and pi. And so one idea. Uh, to build in some momentum dependence into this uh, scheme is to combine this uh, DMFT or extended DMFT self-energy with the momentum dependent self-energy of some weak coupling perturbation theory. And one obvious uh, weak coupling perturbation theory is the GW method. So GW method is sort of a lowest order self-energy approximation in a systematic uh, expansion in the screened interaction W. So So just very, very briefly, what does the GW, what is the GW method? So in the GW method, we approximate the self-energy sigma by the product of the interacting Green's function G and sort of the fully screened interaction W. That's why it's called GW. 
and we approximate the polarization pi simply by the bubble of interacting Green's functions like this. But this is now momentum dependent, so there can be different sites, i and j, here. So a, these are non-local interactions. And so one idea, which is actively sort of explored in this uh, ab initio and DMFT community, is to apply this method, which is widely used sort of in the ab initio world with dynamical mean field theory. And the idea is just to basically take this perturbation theory and replace the local contribution from these diagrams by the DMFT analog, yeah, which sort of corresponds then to a different subset of, of diagrams. So DMFT is believed sort of supposed to, to sum up all the local diagrams. And now in, in addition to these local diagrams, we can add the non-local GW diagrams. So that's, that's the idea. So written as a formula, we now construct a self-energy sigma GW plus EDMFT, which depends on momentum and frequency as follows. We take the EDMFT self-energy, which is only frequency dependent, Add to it the momentum dependent GW self energy. Now, to avoid a double counting between these two, we subtract all the local GW self energy diagrams. So we subtract minus K sum G sigma GW K i omega n. And the same thing for the polarization. So we can define a polarization pi in GW plus E DMFD, which depends on momentum and on sonic frequencies. That is the polarization function from E DMFD. We add to it this non-local polarization bubble from GW. And now to avoid double counting, we have to subtract all the local GW diagrams. <coughs> 
that's how we can construct some momentum dependent self energy. And so how does the scheme look like now in this version? Well, we start, for example, from a converged EDMFT calculation. This converged EDMFT calculation, this gives us the impurity self energy and the impurity polarization. Now we construct a momentum dependent uh, Green's function and polarization in the usual um, DMFT, extended DMFT spirit. So we can U to G, K of I omega N, which is approximated as G zero minus one minus sigma impurity minus one and W K I nu N approximated as one half V tilde minus one minus polarization of the impurity. And then we compute the local Green's functions and from this device field. That's all the same as before. So we compute G local I omega n by summing over k. And then we define the new Weiss field using the impurity Dyson equation as local minus one plus impurity self energy and the analogous thing for the interaction. Now we have our impurity problem defined. And so we solve this impurity problem. So this gives us a new impurity grains function and a new W. And then we can define a new self energy. So the sigma impurity is the Weiss field minus the inverse of the impurity Green's function and the pi impurity the same with the bosonic Weiss field and the bosonic Green's function. Okay, so no, up to now everything is uh, as before, and now comes basically this GW plus DMFT step. We, yeah. This one? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, in principle, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's just a GW self energy, which is uh, non local. I mean, in this diagram, the Green's function and W are non local quantities, so it's in principle a, a K dependent object. Okay. And so what you subscribe to in the last diagram is, is yeah, or all the local di all the local GW diagrams. So if we, um, yeah, if we write this out, say a local a local GW diagram would mean something like this: from I to I. And now the, the interaction is sort of a, contains all, all kinds of uh, bubbles like this. And here in principle we can have I, K, L, I. Oh. So basically all diagrams which go from I back to I will be, will be eliminated. And all the diagrams which go from I to J different from I, we, we keep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the idea of this uh, double counting. Just remove all local GW diagrams. Yeah, that's right. So, so that's what I'm just going to write again. So now. Now we do the GW calculation. So first we evaluate the GW self energies. So pi of GW. So I write it here now in uh, tau space is sum over Q, Green's function Q of tau, Green's function uh, Q minus K of minus tau. So that's this, what I drew as a kind of bubble. And uh, the self energy fermionic one is the product of the Green's function and the screened interaction. That's sort of this diagram. So that's the calculation of the GW diagrams, and then we extract the non-local part of these diagrams by subtracting the local contribution. So we calculate pi GW non-local. That's the usual GW diagram minus all the local GW diagrams. Now this really is just subtracting all the local polarization uh, bubbles. And similarly for the self energy, Now we combine this non-local part with this local impurity 
itself and what she is. Right now, the momentum dependent polarization is the sum of the impurity polarization plus this non local part of the GW polarization. And we write the self energy fermionic one in the same way. Purity. Like this. And then we go back, and then we go back to this step two until convergence is reached. So now we have a new estimate of a momentum dependent self energy. With this, we can compute the local Green's functions. And uh, new Weiss fields. Yeah. And then we iterate this a couple of times until a converged solution is found. So in principle, this is nice because uh, if we now want to combine this with up initial calculations, well, <coughs> if we start from this GW, GW band structure, then we know exactly what are, in a diagrammatic form, what are the correlation effects included in this GW band structure, and then we can properly do the, the double counting if we add the DMFT self energy, and that's not the case if we uh, start from a LDA band structure where we, where we don't know uh, what the correlation effects are in a sort of diagrammatic language. So this is now a, an area of effective sort of research to, to implement this scheme really in a material context. Good. So now, in principle, I have prepared some exercises, but I think we are running a bit late to start exercises. So maybe I'll just um, <coughs> discuss one of the interesting things, which was also part of the exercises on the board here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want to do it for materials, yes. Okay. And, uh, and from that, uh, what we get structure? We get uh, the orbitals to start the uh, That's right. You get sort of a, yeah, you get the, the orbitals to define your your kind of Hubbard, Hubbard model for the correlated orbitals. Few band model, yeah, that's in practice you can of course only treat a few uh, correlated bands. So then you define some, again, some low energy subspace for just a few orbitals. And you get the interaction from GW for these orbitals. And then you start this loop within this low energy subspace and you 
recompute the interaction in a self consistent way. The GW, you also, but <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, in principle, there would be a feedback even from this low energy subspace to the high energy bands. And I think this is, at the moment is not realistic to do this. But what we can do and already do now is if you stay, if you do one GW calculation, then you restrict yourself to the low energy space, then you can update the GW and the and the DMFT calculation self consistently within this small subspace. And I hope uh, that on a slightly longer time scale of maybe one year or so, we can maybe define an intermediate energy window where we really feed back the DMFT self energy sort of into the GW part and self consistently update the GW in a larger window of maybe 20 electron volts or something, but not the, the 100 electron or 200 electron volts for which the, the initial GW calculation is done. I think that's not realistic. Because nowadays, I mean, the GW calculation for, the, for this very large energy window is much more expensive than the DMFT uh, calculation, so. So yeah, I think we can only really self-consistently do it within a small, a small space. But that's yeah, that's what we do now, and uh, it will be interesting to see if it's really an improvement over previous schemes. But. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, this has already been done. Basically, you do GW and then you do DMFT, and maybe you just combine the results at the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, that you can do, and it's not yet clear whether the self-consistent procedure is giving you better results. I mean, usually in the GW community, it's known that one shouldn't do GW self-consistently because the results are just not good. Um, and the hope was that if you combine it with DMFT, if you have sort of a, a local vertex from DMFT, that you can really do it self-consistently. Because this kind of one-shot philosophy of GW, that's really a bit ad hoc and uh, unsatisfactory. And maybe if one combines, combines GW with the local part of the self energy from, from DMFT, maybe one can really do a meaningful self-consistent calculation. That's, that's the hope. And at least on the model level, it works, and we now are trying to see what what it gives for materials. And yeah, So then maybe in the last 15 minutes, we can just touch a sort of interesting little uh, topic, which is uh, the relationship between this hybridization expansion, which I have described, and a very simple sort of semi-analytical scheme, which is called a non-crossing approximation. So that's a... Uh, Maybe some people in the audience may, may be familiar with non-crossing approximation, and so maybe let's briefly discuss uh, the relationship to that. <clears throat> 
And so let's look again at the simple case of a spinless uh, fermion model. So the partition function is the one we had on the board yesterday, trace time order of product of E to chemical potential term mu and the hybridization term. That's our, our non-interacting electron, which uh, is hybridized with some non-interacting path. And now let's expand this partition function in powers of the hybridization function. Then we get our partition function expressed in terms of these segment configurations, which we had on the board yesterday. of, you have these, uh, let me just draw it for simplicity like this. So here we have a C dagger and C, or also the other way around like this, C, C dagger, and so forth. And many, many more, yeah? So at second order, we have this kind of diagram, and of course also this kind. And also this one, and also uh, this one. And now finally at third order, we find a diagram which has crossing hybridization lines. So the first one with crossing hybridization lines looks like this. Many, many more. Okay. And what was the weight of these diagrams? So basically, here we had. One, here we had e to the beta mu. Here we had e to the mu times tau two minus tau one, some times delta, tau two minus tau one, and so forth. Now the, the point is that we can generate the whole subset of diagrams without crossing hybridization lines in an elegant way with some kind of Dyson equation. So all diagrams except for, for this one on this, on this board, we can, we can generate in, in a sort of iterative manner by defining so-called pseudoparticle uh, Green's functions. So let me explain what this is. 
that's an important point. Those which do not have crossing hybridization lines, we can generate by introducing so-called cytoparticle propagators. And we have two, in this uh, system, we have two states. We have the empty state and we have the full state. And for each of these two states, we now introduce such a propagator. For the empty state, we call it G0. And this uh, sort of bare propagator has the following form. It's minus e to the minus energy of the empty state times tau. Now the energy of the empty state in this problem, I mean, I'm talking now about the empty atomic state, is just zero. So if you have no electron on the impurity, the energy is zero. And similarly, we can define sort of a bare cytoparticle propagator for the singly occupied state. as minus e to the minus energy of the singly occupied state, which in this model is just mu. Singly occupied uh, electrons have energy mu. And you can see that in these diagrams, we basically always have these atomic energies appearing in the, in the weight factor. So we can really sort of produce these weights by considering such uh, cytoparticle propagators which have the atomic energies, eigenenergies in the, in the exponential here. And so how do we do this? We, we now define the following cytoparticle Dyson equations. We write the Dyson equation for the empty state as follows. So we have an interacting cytoparticle Green's function for the empty state. This is the bare cytoparticle Green's function for the empty state, which is defined here, plus bare cytoparticle Green's function for the empty state. And now comes a kind of self-energy insertion, which is of the following form the interacting Green's function for the singly occupied state times a hybridization function. And then comes the bare, uh, the full cytoparticle Green's function for the empty state again. So this is a usual kind of Dyson equation where this is our self-energy. So this thing here is now like a self-energy for this uh, cytoparticle Green's function. So we have a sigma zero in this non-crossing approximation, which is of the form interacting cytoparticle Green's function one times hybridization function. So this would be tau. This would be delta of minus tau. And this would be the self energy at time tau. And in the same way, we can write down a Dyson equation for our singly occupied state. That's the bare cytoparticle Green's function for the singly occupied state plus bare times some other self energy for now the singly occupied state, which has the form interacting Green's function for the empty state times the hybridization function, which goes in the opposite direction like this, and then G1. And so here we have another 
Kinetical energy now for the singly occupied state, which is sigma 1 NCA equals T0 and delta. There may be some sign from sort of the arrow which goes to the right. And if you think about it for a little while, you will find that if you iterate, I mean, these are now two coupled equations which you can iterate, starting from these pair uh, propagators, you will generate exactly uh, the subset of diagrams without uh, these crossing hybridization lines, because in the first iteration you will have one hybridization function like this. Then you replace this interacting Green's function here by the expression here that will generate you further insertions of hybridization functions that you you will never have a cross a crossing between hybridization functions if you if you iterate this. And so it's a it's a very simple calculation. So if we write down these Dyson equations explicitly. They look as follows. So on the time, imaginary time axis, these two Dyson equations can be written like this. from zero now to tau, and from zero to tau two. the first one, and similarly for the G1, So you have two coupled differential equations. Here you have the definition of G0 and G1. And uh, basically you have to solve this with the initial condition that uh, G alpha of 0 is minus 1. Similar to this, Bergrin's functions for alpha 1 and 2. And then uh, you get this interacting pseudoparticle Green's functions. And that's a very, very simple problem. Then you can easily uh, see that the partition function is nothing else than the sum over these interacting zero particle Green's function evaluated at beta and the interacting one particle Green's function also evaluated at beta. And why is this the case? This is because this G0 evaluated at beta is the sum of all diagrams without crossing hybridization lines which start in an empty state and end in an empty state. And this expression here is nothing else than the sum of all diagrams which start in an occupied state and end in an occupied state. So these two give you all the diagrams without crossing hybridization lines from zero to beta. So this is basically the contribution of the empty state basically this contribution to the trace 
and this is the contribution of the occupied state. And similarly, you can easily see, so just one minute, I have to maybe say how we get the Green's function, or the physical one. These are sort of auxiliary type Green's functions, so we need to say how we get the physical Green's function. And so what is the, what is the physical Green's function? Well, the physical Green's function is, is this. Within the NCA approximation, now the physical Green's function is 1, is basically 1 over the partition function in NCA, which we have just written down here. And then, graphically, say we have here a C dagger. So here's our time interval, here's a C dagger, and here's a, a C operator. And this is time zero, and this is time beta. So we want to measure the Green's function where we create a particle at zero, and we annihilate it at, at time tau. Now we can obtain all the diagrams consistent with C dagger here and C here by just taking here the boldified pseudoparticle Green's function G1, because here we, we start with an occupied state. So it's a G1, and then here we annihilate an electron. So here we are in the empty state, so we continue with G0. And that gives us all the, all the diagrams which are consistent with a creation operator here and an annihilation operator here. And that we can write as 1 over C and CA times a bubble of pseudoparticle Green's functions like this. Now this is G of 1 and this is G of 0. So we basically take the product of g1 of tau and g0 of minus tau, and that gives us the physical Green's function. So that's very simple calculation. And a few years ago, when I, I gave this as a kind of exercise to implement this NCA calculation, and so one student basically solved this in, in less than 10 minutes. So he sort of programmed the whole thing, and so it's very, very simple and fast uh, impurity solver for for the MFT, which works at least qualitatively in the in the strongly interacting regime, basically mod insulating regime. Uh, this is a good method in the in the metallic regime. It's not very good because this. Restriction to non-crossing diagrams is not really a good approximation in the in the metallic uh, metallic regime. But if you have time and are interested in these in these methods, maybe it's fun to implement these these uh, coupled equations and solve them and see what what it gives. Yes. Well, it thought, yeah, it's somehow the result is always too insulating. Basically, in a <clears throat> the hybridization function in the metal is decaying slowly, so. So in an insulator, your G of tau is going like exponential, decaying exponentially with time. Whereas in a metal, your G of tau is basically going like one over tau. So it's decaying slowly at long times. And the hybridization function is 
behaving in the same way as the Green's function. So it's the hybridization function in, a, in an insulator is decaying very fast. The hybridization function in a metal is decaying slowly. So that's how one can understand why in an insulator maybe crossing hybridization functions are not so relevant. But in a metal where you have where your hybridization function is not decaying fast, of course the crossing diagrams are important. And that's why this approximation is not working well in the in the metallic phase. It even becomes unphysical if you do this approximation at low energies at uh, low temperature in the metallic phase, you get you get unphysical results, like uh, causality violations in the in the spectral function and, and things like this. But in the MOT insulator, well, electrons don't hop very much. Uh, basically, this approximation works rather well. Okay, I guess if there are no further questions, we can stop here. Yeah, thank you for your attention.